People often say there is a fine line between our two most powerful emotions, love and hate. On one end, there's love so intense that someone would give their life for their beloved. Isn't that what they called immortal love? On the other hand, there's the person who would go to any length to satisfy their burning hatred, even to the point of self-harm. Excessive, isn't it? Yet, most married couples experience both emotions in their marriage, though not usually to such extremes. However, during times of stress, particularly after an argument, we can cross that line. I can personally attest to this. For me, it's like going to the dark side. My name is Richard Russell, and I am the business manager for Charlotte Plastics. I turned 33 last month, and have been married to the love of my life, Barbara, for nine and a half years. We have two sons, Oscar, who is seven, and Edward, who is eight. We live in a large house in a suburb of Charlotte. We have many friends in our neighborhood, and we often spend weekends at someone's house for a party or barbecue. When we first got married, we lived elsewhere and had a different group of friends. Barbara didn't like most of them, as they weren't as sophisticated as our current friends and didn't care about things like cars or house size. They were a close-knit group that enjoyed having fun, but would always have your back when needed. When Barbara decided we should move to a nicer place, we had our first big fight. Our house was only 20 minutes from where we both worked, and our mortgage payments were relatively low. I'm a laid-back kind of guy and don't care much about the finer things in life, unlike my wife, who is always seeking something better. So when Barbara insisted on moving, I complained for about a week and then thought, what the hell? Most things really aren't worth arguing about. A car, a house, clothes. They're just material possessions that ultimately don't define life. So when Barbara persisted, I let her make the decision. It just wasn't worth the energy to argue with her about it. You might call me a pushover, but I can count on one hand the number of fights Barbara and I have had in the last nine years. That was until last night. Barbara works at an interior design studio owned by one of our neighbors. She works from 9 o'clock m to 4 o'clock p.m. So she can take the kids to school in the morning and be home when they get off the bus. I, on the other hand, work from 8 o'clock m to 5 o'clock p.m., depending on traffic. I usually get home around 5.30 p.m., where we used to live. I was home with a drink in hand by 5.20 p.m. on most days. However, Tuesday night was different. There was an accident in the driveway, so I didn't get home until almost 6.20 p.m. I was a little tense when I arrived, but figured at least I was finally home and could relax with my wife. I sneaked in through the back door and went upstairs to change into shorts and an old t-shirt. As I came downstairs to the kitchen, I heard Barbara talking on the phone. Don't worry, Beatrice, you know Richard. He'll agree with everything I say, I heard Barbara say to her sister. No, he won't get mad. I think I know my husband a little better than you do. I thought this through, and I plan to talk to him tonight after dinner. Yeah, I'll call you and let you know what he says. Well, I've got to go, girl. I've got to finish dinner. I'll talk to you later, Barbara said before hanging up. What do we need to talk about? I asked as I turned the corner. Richard, you scared me, Barbara said as I came into view. Let me ask you again. What do we need to talk about that should wait until after dinner? I asked, taking a beer out of the fridge and sitting down at the kitchen table. Let's wait until after dinner when the boys go upstairs. Okay, what do they do this time? I talked to the boys about the cart and not hitting golf balls in the backyard. What else could they have done since Saturday night? It's not about the boys, it's about us. Well, I haven't done anything wrong since I grabbed your ass at Mark's Grill last Friday night. And the only reason I did that was because you looked so hot in those new jeans. What did you buy this time? I asked, trying to lighten the mood. That's not what I'm talking about. It's about how we treat each other, she began. Well, baby, you know I love you, and I know you love me. So what's the problem? Yes, Richard, you know I love you, she said, holding my hands in hers but I'm not sure I still love you. What? I don't understand, Barbara, I said, feeling uneasy about the direction of the conversation. If you have something to say, say it. 
You're the best and most caring husband in the world and a wonderful father, she said, touching my cheek. But I'm just not sure I feel the same way about you as I did when we got married. Barbara said with a concerned look on her face. I'm thinking about a trial separation to figure out how I feel. Barbara, I don't understand. When the hell did all this happen? Before or after we kissed goodbye this morning? I said, now more worried about where she was going with this. I've been thinking about it for a while, but I didn't want to say anything until I was sure of what I wanted. I don't understand. Where do you want to go? I asked. What do you mean? Well, I'm thinking of having you move in with your mother for a while. Ever since your father died, she's been alone in that big house. Maybe she needs some company, Barbara said, as if she were explaining to a child. I started to get angry, but kept it to myself. How are you going to pay for the house and everything else if I leave? I asked, already anticipating her response. I could feel myself approaching the dark side. You'll still have to pay, but it won't be forever, just until I can figure something out, she said in her most loving and caring voice. I stood up. No, Barbara. No, she asked, surprised. Barbara, what don't you understand? No, I'm not moving in with my mom, and no, I'm not leaving my house and my two sons. If you need to leave and sort things out, then do it. I don't want you here if you don't love me anymore, as you so eloquently put it. Since I'm such a great guy, I'll even help you get ready, I said, slamming my beer down on the table and heading upstairs to our bedroom. Barbara was shocked when I came back downstairs with an armful of her clothes. Put these in the car, and I'll be down with the next load in a minute. I threw the clothes on the living room couch and jogged back up the stairs. As I came down with the next handful, Barbara started yelling for me to stop. I thought you wanted a separation. I'm just helping you move your stuff out, that's all. I told her in a calm voice. At this point, I crossed the line from love to hate in my feelings for her, or as I now like to call it, the dark side. I want you to leave, she shouted at me. That's not going to happen, Barbara. This is my home, and I haven't done anything to you or the kids to make you kick me out. Now if you want to go down to the basement, I can put your stuff there, I said, throwing my second armful of clothes on top of the others. This wasn't going at all the way Barbara had planned. She thought Richard would tuck tail and leave without saying a word. She said to herself, he shouldn't have made a fuss. And now, what the hell am I supposed to do? Let's talk about this like two adults, Richard, she pleaded. Barbara, I think you said enough. At least now, I know how you really feel about me, so make up your mind. Where do you want to put your clothes? Because you're definitely not staying in my bedroom anymore, I said, trying my best to stay calm. When our sons, Oscar and Edward, came through the door, they wanted to know what was going on. Mom just moved some of her stuff, that's all. How about we go get some hamburgers and let her finish up? I didn't have to ask twice. We left and came back 50 minutes later with food. However, we returned to find a few extra people. Two police officers. What can I do for you? I asked, getting out of the car and telling my sons to go inside. We got a call about a domestic dispute and we need to talk to you. The bigger officer said, his hand resting on his gun. Officer, you won't need that, I said, explaining the situation. I told him I had come home, hadn't raised my voice, threatened my wife or children, but had refused to leave the house. My name's on the mortgage. I pay all the bills, and unless there's a court order, which I highly doubt, I believe I have every right to be here. I told my wife that if she wasn't happy with me, she could move out, and I would even help her pack. The officers chuckled, seemingly entertained by my predicament. Barbara, however, became irate when the officers told her there was nothing they could do. They said they would file a report stating that I was calm, and not a danger to my family or myself. But Barbara ranted, raved, and used profanity while talking about her husband. Finally, all I wanted to do was help my wife load her personal belongings into the car. That was all they witnessed. I thanked them, shook their hands, and they wished me luck. Barbara was pissed off that she didn't get her way. Richard, why don't you just leave and make things easier for all of us? She shouted at me. 
Like I said, Barbara, that's not going to happen. So decide where you want to put your stuff. In the car or in the basement? It's your choice, I replied. The guys and I are going to eat on the deck, so think carefully about what you're going to do next, I said, grabbing my food and heading to the deck where my sons were waiting for me. What happened to Mom? Oscar and Edward asked. Who knows, maybe she had a bad day at work. Let's give her some space. You know, Mom, she'll be back to her old self soon. I told them, not believing it myself. We ate and then watched a special on the X Games being held in Charlotte. Why don't you guys go upstairs? I'll be up later to check on you. I said. They went upstairs and I went looking for Barbara. She was gone, leaving her clothes on the couch where I had placed them. I went upstairs and noticed a few drawers were pulled out and her two suitcases were missing. Well, I guess that answers that. I said as I sat on the bed, wondering what was going to happen next. Heck, I had left a loving wife and family at 7.10 a.m. and now at 9.10 p.m. I had two sons, but no loving wife. Sometimes life really sucks. Mom, I need a big favor, I said when I called my mom. I laid out the whole story to her and asked if she could stop by to make sure the boys got off the school on time and were home when they returned. Maybe Barbara's hormones were just running wild. She'll probably come back once she realizes what a fool she's made of herself. But I'll be there in the morning just to make sure, she reassured me. I thanked my mom, but told her I wasn't as sure as she was. I was right. Barbara didn't come back on Wednesday or Thursday. She called the boys on Thursday afternoon to say hi, but didn't speak to me. By Saturday morning, I was still feeling like an idiot. I was concerned, but also angry. You have no one to blame but yourself, I said, starting to beat myself up. If you hadn't been such a pushover all these years, Barbara would never have tried to kick you out of your own house. Now she's sulking at her parents, telling everyone what an insensitive jerk I am for not considering her feelings. To hell with her and the Dan house, I said, looking around. I never wanted it, and it's too big for the four of us anyway. Barbara's sister, Beatrice, came over on Sunday afternoon to pick up some things for her. Hi, Beatrice. I greeted her at the door. I figured she'd send you to get some new clothes. You know, Barbara, it's all about her. She smiled. I told her you wouldn't agree, but she said she knew you better than I did. I guess she was wrong. I should have stood up to her a long time ago, but I figured I'd keep the peace in the family by not saying anything. Any idea when she's coming back? I have no idea. She's still in the sulking stage, but mom is ready to kick her out if she doesn't pull herself together. But you know, dad, his little girl can do no wrong. You want to say for dinner? We have grilled chicken, baked potatoes and corn on the cob, I said. Let me pack her things and then we'll make arrangements, Beatrice replied with a smile. The boys were happy to see Beatrice and we all had a nice dinner together. She got two text messages from Barbara asking where the hell she was, but she never replied. We got everything cleaned up and around eight o'clock, she said she better get going. Thanks for stopping by. It was nice to see a friendly face for a change. If you need anything, give me a call, I said. I told my sister she is ruining a good marriage, but all her friends are telling her to stand her ground and that you will come around soon. I told her that's not going to happen. Am I right? Absolutely, but you'd better go before you get into more trouble than you are now. Beatrice hugged me tightly, kissed me on the cheek, and walked out the door. Marrying the wrong sister, I said to myself. The following three weeks were tough. Mom took care of the kids, and although Barbara called the boys, she refused to speak to me. Instead, she sent me two lengthy emails about how unsupported she felt, along with a load of other nonsense. What surprised me was being excluded from neighborhood gatherings while Barbara was still invited. It seemed they had already chosen sides. The kids were the first to notice, repeatedly asking when mom was coming home. I'm not sure, guys. It's really up to her. I'm not holding her back. She's making her own decisions. I told them as we went grocery shopping on Saturday morning. My life was beginning to change. As I walked down the aisle with my two sons, 
Someone grabbed me from behind and lifted me off the ground. You're such a whipped dork. You're probably stroking her ego right now too. A familiar voice taunted me. If this is as high as you can lift me, you're still out of shape, you piece of crap. What Susan saw in you, I'll never know. I laughed. I thought you disappeared off the face of the earth. Are you too good for us now that you have such a big house? Joseph asked. I've always been too good for you, just never realized it. I said, having him. It's good to see you guys. Later, Joseph said, walking back to the aisle. Was that Uncle Joseph? My boys asked, wide-eyed. Yes, it was Uncle Joseph, and we better hurry up. I don't want to be late for this party. We need to get going, I said, checking the time. We rose just after 6.40, and Susan came out, giving me a big hug. Her girls grabbed my boys, and they headed to the backyard. Where's Barbara? Susan asked. That's a whole other story, I replied. Well, I'm glad you and the boys made it. Everyone will be glad to see you, I added. Susan told me that they were our friends and treated us as if we had never left. The kids and I had a great time. And at the end of the evening, when everyone had left, Joseph and I sat down. They wanted to know what had happened between Barbara and me. All I could do was shake my head and tell them I had no idea. We never fought, never argued. Maybe that was the problem. I let her do whatever she wanted to keep peace in the family. I was getting as much sex as I wanted, and I thought Barbara was happy, I said. Who knows, Susan said, it's probably just a woman thing. I think it's much deeper than that. You don't tell your husband you love him, but aren't in love with him. It's all just empty talk, I replied. It never occurred to me that Barbara might be fooling around, but I wouldn't bet on it. Now I'll keep my eyes open and my mouth shut and watch it all play out. There is no more Mr. Nice Guy. From now on, my kids come first, me second, and to hell with everyone else, especially my fair weather neighborhood friends, I concluded. Every week on Sundays, Beatrice came over to pick up new clothes for Barbara. She always joined us for dinner, and I found myself anticipating her visits. On Saturday morning, I dropped my boys off at Barbara's mother's house, hoping to talk to her. However, after the first explosive encounter, I was relieved to simply drop them off and walk away. This way, there would be no more confrontations on the front lawn. I went from anger to nearly giving up before sinking into depression. It felt like going through a seven-step program for alcoholics. I even attempted to elicit answers from Barbara by sending her weekly emails, expressing my love and longing for her, but to no avail. Richard, please be patient, my love, she wrote. I just want to resolve these pesky issues so they don't resurface later. I know this has been hard on you and the boys, but just hold on a little longer, she added. At least that gave me hope. Three long months later, as I was washing dishes on a Sunday, Beatrice hit me with shocking news. Barbara went on a date last night, and it wasn't the first time, she said, without meeting my gaze. I protested, calling her crazy, but she insisted. I think you should know, she added, avoiding eye contact. I stood there with a soapy rag in my hands, feeling too stunned or shocked to respond. It was the first time I felt paralyzed since Barbara had left. I contemplated life without her. Sure, I had gotten angry and yelled a few times, but I always believed she'd come back and we'd find happiness again. Now for the first time, I realized that might not happen. Hey Richard, are you alive? Beatrice repeated, tapping my chest. Snap out of it. Your damn wife is out there somewhere, and all you can do is stand there. I grabbed her arms and then pulled her into a hug. Tears welled up in my eyes as I heard Beatrice start to cry. This isn't fair. You're such a good guy, and all she's doing is using you. It's not right, she said as she hugged me. No, it wasn't right, and I finally snapped, throwing the rag against the wall. Wow. I yelled as the kids entered the room, curious about the commotion. Dad, what's going on? They asked. Aunt Beatrice slipped on the floor and banged her knee. That's all. I explained to my boys. Remember, we still have a movie to watch, and we're waiting for you, they reminded us. 
As they returned to the living room, Beatrice and I sat on the couch, holding hands, while my boys sat in front of the projection TV. I had seen Spider-Man three times, and they had seen it at least six times, as we all watched in silence. I'm sorry, Beatrice whispered, squeezing my hand. I was lost in a daze on the dark side. Mentally, I was strategizing my next steps, not revenge yet, but an instinct for self-preservation. After the movie, I put the kids to bed and escorted Beatrice to the door. Are you okay? She asked me. No, but I'll manage. Call me if you need anything or just want to talk, she said, kissing me on the cheek. You know she's acting foolish, Beatrice remarked as she exited. Call me on Monday. I took a vacation. The next day, I took the kids to school and then sat down at the computer. We had two Visa credit cards with outstanding balances. I paid off both of them and closed the accounts. Then I visited the bank and transferred 50% of our remaining funds to a new account in my name only. They informed me it would take six business days to remove my name from the existing accounts. Next, I contacted the HR department at work and removed Barbara from my life insurance policy, medical and dental insurance. I changed the locks on the house myself, updating the security codes on the front door and garage door opener. At the mall, I cancelled my cell phone plan, incurring an additional $330 and started a new plan in my name. Just wait until Barbara tries to use her cell phone. That should be amusing, I remarked with a smile, the first genuine one in a while. I kept the home phone number the same, but left a message on the answering machine instructing Barbara to call her parents' home phone number. When the kids returned home, I gathered their old house keys. Guys, I need your old house keys. I changed the locks, and here are your new ones. I distributed each of them a new key and disposed of the old ones in the trash. It's done, I whispered to myself, realizing how swiftly I transitioned from a content husband to a single parent in just nine hours. I sensed the explosion looming on the horizon. Later that evening, the house phone rang, and I instructed the boys to let the answering machine pick up. What the hell are you doing, Richard Russell? My cell phone isn't working, and neither are my credit cards. I need you to call me right now and explain why you're being so awful, Barbara's voice echoed through the message. She only called me Richard Russell when she was furious. It took a mere nine hours to push her to the edge and over 2.5 months to lose her completely. Shortly after, Beatrice called, announcing she was on her way. Grab the kids because we're all going out to dinner, she declared, hustling us to get ready. What's the hurry? I questioned. Barbara and my parents are planning to come over for a serious talk. So, if you want to avoid that nonsense, come with me, she urged. We ended up at Bunny's Barbecue. The food was satisfying, and we all enjoyed ourselves. You know, I changed the locks, right? I mentioned. That's what I figured when I heard you cancelled her credit cards, cell phone, and insurance, Beatrice responded. That girl sure knows how to spend, she added, recounting the details to my parents. That's what I suspected, but you know Daddy's stunts. He's the lord and protector of his little girls. Even when they're wrong, Beatrice commented, turning to me. What are you going to do now? She inquired. Nothing, I replied, except put that monstrous house on the market. I despise that house from the beginning, and even if we reconcile eventually, I want it gone. You know you can't sell the house without her consent, Beatrice reminded me. I know, but once the for sale sign goes up, we'll be the talk of the neighborhood, I said, a wide grin spreading across my face. We were out for almost three hours. The kids needed to go to bed, so we finally headed home. Are you and mom getting a divorce? The kids asked when I put them to bed that night. We asked mom, and she said no, but she doesn't live here anymore, I explained. Kids, I can't say yes or no right now. You know your mom and I love you very much, but I don't think she wants to live with me anymore, so we'll just have to wait and see what she decides. I kissed them both goodnight, assuring them that I love them and everything would be okay. Grabbing a bottle of beer, I offered one to Beatrice as we sat down at the kitchen table. You know you can't hide forever, 
that you? She remarked. I'm not going to, I replied. She knows where I live and work, so it shouldn't be hard for her to find me. Barbara burst into my office. How dare you cancel my credit cards and cell phone? She began clearly furious. And when did you change the locks on the house? I greeted her calmly. Hi, Barbara, you look good. How are you doing? She seemed taken aback by my nonchalant demeanor. I'm fine, and the boys really miss you not living with us. I continued casually. Yeah, I'd lost a few pounds. Thanks for noticing. I added with a light tone. I kept the conversation flowing, much to Barbara's surprise. Richard, what the hell are you talking about? She finally exclaimed. I'm just addressing the questions you ought to be asking, given that we haven't seen each other for almost four months now. If you'd like, we can sit down and talk. But if you start yelling and screaming, I'll have to ask you to leave, since this is a business office after all. All right, why did you do all this last week? Why did you start dating? Aren't we married, or am I missing something? I queried. It was just dinner with a friend, she replied. Did you sleep with him? I pressed. No, I didn't sleep with him. It was just dinner. I told you, she responded. Are you going to sleep with him? I asked. Why are you asking me all these questions? She retorted. I just want to know what my schedule is, I clarified. What's your schedule? Barbara asked as she questioned the reason for the divorce. I said to a shocked Barbara, I don't want a divorce. Damn it, Barbara shouted back at me. Well, that's just the way you act. Dating, ignoring your husband and kids, buying new underwear for someone other than me. All signs that you were moving on without us, Barbara. They still send credit card bills to the house, so I know what you're buying, just not clear who it's for, I stated firmly. I told you I don't want a divorce. All I need is some time to myself, she repeated, but this time I didn't let her off the hook. How much time, Barbara? How much more time do you need? I demanded. I don't know. How can I answer when I don't know? She responded. She responded, well, when you find out, please let me know. But it better be soon if you want to try and save this marriage, as I stood up. So I still have work to do, and I have a meeting in 15 minutes. She attempted to kiss me goodbye, but I turned away. Though she wasn't pleased, she didn't say anything. Beatrice, do you want to go to the party on Saturday night? I asked. Sure, where? She replied. Just meet us at the house at seven o'clock and dress casually, I instructed. I informed her that Joseph and the band were planning a huge adults-only party, and I didn't want to attend alone again. We were among the last to arrive. I thought you said 7.20, I queried. Joseph, Brian, and Ronald showed up at 6.50 and fired up the smoker, while the girls prepared potato salad and baked beans. Before I knew it, everyone had arrived, and by 7 o'clock, the party was in full swing, so don't blame me. I introduced everyone to Beatrice and exclaimed, let's get this party started, as I opened a beer for each of us before Susan and the other girls whisked Beatrice away. Joseph asked, Barbara's little sister nice? Is she good in bed? Are you crazy? She's my damn sister-in-law. How shall I know? I retorted. One of these days, Joseph, you're really going to have to pull your head out of your ass. The party proceeded much like old times, with beer flowing and women chatting, and occasionally griping about their men. Every now and then, I glanced over to see how Beatrice was faring. She appeared to be genuinely enjoying the socializing. After dinner, the doubles games commenced, starting with 26 quest questions, 13 for the guys and 13 for the women. The consequence for answering a question incorrectly was taking a swig of beer. It might not sound like much, but by the end of the night, many of us were feeling the effects. The questions covered things we should have known about each other. Birthdays, weight, eye color, where we first met, mother's maiden name, etc. I was surprised when Beatrice scored nine points compared to my three. She probably knew me better than I realized. Next came the challenge of passing items between pairs. The larger items were relatively easy, but when we reached the spoon and shot glass, I failed miserably, 
due to the close contact. Through this, I got to know Beatrice and her sturdy physique better, realizing she was far more nimble than me. My failures meant sip after sip of beer, and by the end of the night, I was feeling no pain. Let me help you get him into the car, Joseph offered to Beatrice. I hadn't seen him this drunk in ages, but I felt he needed it tonight. Do you want me to walk you home and help you put him to bed, he asked. No, that won't be necessary, but thanks for offering. He has a guest room downstairs, and if I can't get him upstairs, I'll just leave him there, Beatrice replied as she headed towards my house. I hadn't planned on waking up at 4.15 in the morning, but my bladder had other ideas. I suppose you can't drink gallons of beer without facing consequences. As I sat up and swung my legs off the bed, my head was throbbing. Heck, it even hurt to blink. I clumsily navigated my way past the nightstand, the bed's edge, and the bathroom door frame before finally reaching the bathroom. It wasn't until I was about to lower my shorts that I realized I wasn't wearing any. Standing there, swaying slightly, I made the decision. After relieving myself, still feeling half drunk, I shuffled back to bed. Climbing back in, I found my wife lying there, also naked. I inhaled the scent of her hair, planting kisses on her bare shoulder and neck as I snuggled closer. Drifting off, I became increasingly aroused, though I doubted she would want to be intimate in our current state. Even when I stirred her awake for a kiss, she sometimes got annoyed, her eyes still closed. Feeling her respond, we became completely absorbed in each other for the next 15 minutes. In silent synchronization, our breaths quickened, hearts raced, until we both reached the peak together. There were no loud exclamations or forceful movements, just tender embraces. Afterward, I kissed her neck, held her close, and we drifted into sleep. Even with my eyes closed tightly, the light filtering through the windows signaled morning. As I began to emerge from my slumber, my head pounded, and my mouth tasted foul. I struggled to recall how we made it home, but everything was hazy as I pulled her closer. I need to use the bathroom. I'll be right back, she said, leaping up and dashing naked into the bathroom, even in her half-asleep state. I could hear the sound of her brushing her teeth and rinsing her mouth. She didn't delicately hop back onto our bed at all. If you're expecting any action this morning, head to the bathroom and do something about that breath. I can smell mine on your face, she chuckled. Okay, I replied. A bit tipsy, very tired, and with my brain likely not firing on all cylinders. But when I heard her laughter, something clicked. It wasn't Barbara. We broke up, and she hasn't been home in over three months. I mumbled to myself, sitting up and meeting Beatrice's gaze. Like I said, if you need something, you'd better hurry up. Remember, you told mom we'd pick up the kids after lunch. So go, she urged, nudging me out of bed. As I brushed my teeth and washed my face, I glanced at Beatrice, seated naked on the bed, her knees drawn up and arms wrapped around them. Pinching myself once and peering into the mirror, I had to make sure this wasn't some wild dream. How? When? Why? I cycled through all these questions, trying to piece together how this had happened. Well, when I brought you home, you were pretty drunk. I finally managed to get you inside, and as we started up the stairs, you slipped, grabbed me, and we both tumbled down the stairs, Beatrice explained. He found it hilarious and started laughing, which made me laugh too. Then you playfully pushed me, and I pushed you back. Next thing I knew, we were wrestling on the floor. He kissed me out of the blue, and then you started chasing me all over the house. I returned the kiss, or at least, it wasn't exactly a kiss. Beatrice recounted with a smirk. You chased me upstairs and into your bedroom. I instructed you to undress before getting into bed, and you responded that if you were stripping down, then why not me too? So thinking, what the hell, I decided to follow suit. I tucked you into bed, assuming you might sneak out once you were asleep. But then, a few minutes later, you struck a deal with me. You were left in your underwear, and I noticed you typically wore boxers, so I found it odd. Beatrice jumped in saying, well as I was saying and continued, you eventually stripped down to your shorts and casually tossed them onto the pile of clothes. 
I removed my panties and told you to get into bed. You complied, pulling back the sheets. I thought, great, you'll probably pass out in a few minutes, so I'm safe. Turns out, I was wrong. One thing led to another, and we almost crossed the line. I questioned, to which Beatrice responded with a wide grin. Well, Richard, you came at me with kisses, tongues, and eager hands. I never knew you had such a wild side, and no inhibitions. Barbara never mentioned that to me. Why didn't you stop me? You're practically family. Richard, Barbara has been seeing someone behind your back for at least a month, Beatrice explained. I figured you deserved a bit of payback. Plus, I've always harbored a crush on you and wanted to find out what you were like in bed. And I must say, I wasn't disappointed. Are you asking if we slept together? Almost. You were quite intoxicated. So why didn't I leave after that? Well, I couldn't recall much of what happened last night. I briefly pondered it, but exhaustion took over, assuming you'd sleep until noon. Little did I expect you'd be seeking a repeat performance at five o'clock in the morning. We can't. Barbara's your sister. I attempted to protest, but my words fell on deaf ears as you pounced on me. This is my sister, the one I once knew and loved, Beatrice declared, planting a kiss on my lips. Now get up. We still need to shower and fetch the kids. The shower lingered longer than expected. We indulged in playful intimacy, but as the hot water turned cold after half an hour, we reluctantly ended our morning escapade and headed for breakfast. Once sober, the reality dawned on me that I needed to make a decisive choice with Beatrice. I don't think continuing this is wise. After all, I'm married and Barbara is your sister, I stated plainly. Richard, I'll remain discreet, and no one needs to know, she insisted. Besides, how long will you keep up this facade of a marriage? If Barbara isn't back by Saturday morning, I'm seeing a lawyer. I won't mention anything to the kids. My mom plans to take them out of town on Friday after school, so I'll have an answer by the weekend. I explained, Beatrice appeared disappointed with my response. We fetched the kids and returned home to prepare dinner. The evening passed quietly between Beatrice and me before she announced her departure. I escorted her to the car, holding her briefly before she drove off. That night, I composed a brief, direct letter to Barbara. Unless you're fully committed to being my wife and mother to our children, I'm Corley quits. Time is running out, and a decision needs to be made. Barbara phoned on Tuesday evening, announcing her return. She explained she had left on Friday, and that we would have the entire night to converse. I felt a mix of elation and remorse. As the week progressed, Barbara called daily, as did Beatrice, relaying Barbara's happiness at being home and offering her best wishes for both of us. Arriving home on Friday evening, I found Barbara already waiting, a glass in hand. I embraced her, and our kiss felt unfamiliar after four months apart. We dined, conversed, and conversed some more, both aware of what lay ahead. It seemed we were both evading the inevitable. As she emerged from the bedroom, completely nude, I awaited her in bed, longing for her beauty. Our lovemaking was tender, as it had been for nine years, but she seemed distant. Barbara, you didn't make love to me tonight. I addressed my wide-eyed wife. I don't know who you were thinking of, but certainly not me. After nine years, I know your body as well as my own. How long has this affair been going on? And please, don't insult my intelligence by claiming it lasted only six months. It's over. I ended it a while ago, she responded, a look of horror crossing her face. So, the real reason you left was to be with him. Is that true? I pressed. It began that way. I needed time alone to decide whom I wanted, she confessed. So, after all these months you've been with him, and now you expect to waltz back into my life as if nothing happened. As if I should just embrace you and say, It's okay, honey, I'm just glad you're back. Barbara, did you fool around with anyone else while you were away? What does that have to do with anything? We're discussing the fact that you've had a lover for the past six months. I just want to know the extent of your deceit. Well, Barbara, I did once, but unlike you, I was drunk and only realized the next morning. 
Now that I know the truth about the person I'm married to, I can finally make the difficult decisions I've been avoiding. Richard, I'm back with you. It's over. I made a colossal mistake, and I admit it. I'm not proud of what I did, but I'm begging you to give me another chance. I love you, and I'm pleading for an opportunity to mend our family. Please. What was I supposed to say to that? Sure, Barbara, everything's fine. No, I need time to process this. Right now, I'm furious. Just tell me it wasn't one of our friends or a colleague. It was someone I met through work, and it's over. She repeated. Friday and Saturday, I slept in the guest room. It was lonely, but I needed space to contemplate my next steps. We spent the entire weekend talking. She promised to answer any questions truthfully. I didn't want all the details, but I needed to understand why. Initially, it felt exhilarating, like I was a rebellious teenager hiding something from her parents. He gave me more attention in one week than you have in the past two years. I fell under his spell, but it didn't last. After a while, the excitement faded, and it became purely physical. We both agreed it wasn't worth it, and neither of us wanted our spouses to find out. So, it was a brief affair. By Sunday morning, I realized my mistake and wanted you back. My mind was overwhelmed with issues, and I needed a distraction. Dinner at her mother's house was a tradition she had missed during those months. As we were leaving, her mom hugged me, slipped something into my pocket, and whispered for me to call her tomorrow. The next two weeks were restless. I still slept in the spare room, and the kids were happy to have their mom back. On Friday afternoon, I left her tent to some matters I couldn't handle after work or at night. I turned off my cell phone to avoid distractions. When I turned it back on, there were 13 messages from Barbara. I grabbed a beer and was halfway through it when she barged in, waving an envelope. What's this, Richard? She shouted. What does it look like, Barbara? Why are you serving me? I thought we were trying to reconcile, she yelled. We were close, Barbara, but it was just the two of us. Now there's no hope for all three of us. I said to a shocked Barbara as she sank back into her chair. You know, I was inclined to be on your side because of the kids and all the wonderful memories we shared. But two weeks ago, something new came to light to put our marriage on pause. How did you find out? she asked. No one knew, she replied. Does it even matter how I found out, Barbara? So, you were just going to deceive me like some naive fool and make me believe it was mine. I said angrily. You really disappoint me, Barbara. It never should have happened. I'm deeply sorry, Richard. I don't love him, just you. We can resolve this and go back to how things were, she pleaded. He gave me enough money to take care of it, so his wife won't find out either, she added, each word only making matters worse. I hope you three will be happy. I do love you, Richard, truly. We can overcome this, and if you want, we can sell this house, buy another, and start fresh elsewhere. Barbara suggested, we're finished. In fact, we've been over for quite some time. I just couldn't bring myself to admit it for the sake of the kids. You can stay here until the house sells or until you find another place to live. I plan to take the kids with me, but you can see them whenever you like. I don't want anything from you except for you to leave my life, I said firmly. She cried the entire weekend, and when I picked up the kids, we had a lengthy heart to heart. It wasn't a complete shock to them that we had separated, but they weren't pleased about it. After all, she was their mother. We divided everything equally, and once all our bills were settled, I had enough money to purchase a modest home in a friendlier neighborhood. Barbara had effectively addressed her situation, and I respected her decision not to disclose it to anyone. However, there was one lingering issue. You see, Barbara's mother discreetly slipped something into my jacket pocket that Sunday, and it changed everything. The following day, I contacted her to inquire about the contents. I shouldn't be sharing this, but if I don't, you'll never know the truth, she began. She had discovered a pregnancy test in the guest bathroom the morning after Barbara moved out. It took her a few days to muster the courage to inform me. Since she was the only woman in the house, and it certainly wasn't hers, 
it could only belong to Barbara. I didn't want to be the one to break this to you, but I feared Barbara might attempt to deceive you, she admitted. Come to think of it, you didn't hear it from me. Understood, Mom. I appreciate your honesty, I replied. I hate to say this, Richard, but I love her deeply. Don't be a stranger, she concluded before hanging up. That's how I learned of Barbara's pregnancy. It might have been more ideal to discover a test kit or doctor's report, or to catch her in the act at some shady motel. Yet, in the end, it was her own mother who unintentionally revealed the truth. I discovered a house close to where Barbara and I had resided for all those years. It boasted four bedrooms, two and one half bathrooms, and a spacious patio though it lacked a pool. With the boy's assistance and the help of my new assistant, the transition was much smoother. After the divorce was finalized, we gathered for Thanksgiving dinner at Barbara's mom's house. During the meal, the kids excitedly shared updates about our new home, expressing their delight in having their own bedrooms and bathrooms. Edward proudly recounted how he got to choose the colors for the walls and trim. His words caught Barbara's attention, and she asked him to repeat himself. Edward reiterated the bedroom arrangements. Oscar has his room. I have mine, Dad and Aunt Beatrice have theirs, and there's still one left for guests. Barbara's abrupt question about Aunt Beatrice's residence prompted a candid admission from the kids. Since we moved into the new house, Edward replied nonchalantly, while enjoying dessert. Barbara's reaction was immediate, as she called out, Richard Russell. But the truth was out, and I shared a kiss with Beatrice in the kitchen, acknowledging that it was only a matter of time before the secret came to light. Beatrice chimed in, noting that Mom and Dad would have figured it out eventually, gesturing to her growing belly. With the revelation out in the open, I extended my hand, suggesting it was time to leave. I'd be delighted to, Beatrice replied as we stepped into the dining room. The atmosphere was akin to the shock and awe of the Gulf War. Barbara seethed with anger at the sight of me now with her younger sister. On the other hand, her mom beamed with joy at the prospect of another grandchild, while her dad seemed relieved that he wouldn't have to adjust to yet another son-in-law. Meanwhile, Beatrice and I were simply elated. In hindsight, I believe I may have married the wrong sister initially, but I rectified that before it was too late. This narrative is brimming with emotions and dramatic turns, rendering it captivating. It underscores the intricacies of human relationships and the courage required to navigate challenging life choices. The compelling dynamics between the characters and the unexpected plot twists keep the audience enthralled until the very end. Thank you for listening and ear to my tale. Feel free to share your thoughts and explore other videos.